God's moving in this place. Can I just tell you something? I love this church. And I, I don't mean the building. The building's wonderful. I thank God for that. But you, you are such a blessing. It is, it is such an honor. My wife and I and I my wife and I were talking about it. So they have how how much of an honor and a blessing it is to be your pastors. And uh, last night it was funny. We were leaving the service, and it was such a powerful service last night. And we're leaving the service, and my son and I are backing out of the driveway, and my son, my son says something so interesting. He says, Dad, we have such a great church. He goes, I, Daddy, I love our church. And I said, son, so do I. That's, how, that's what you want. That's what a dad wants to hear his son say, right? And I'm like, Dad, stop dragging me to church. Right? Dad, I love our church. God is good. You know, as we're continuing on with this series, Kingdom Come, I want to preach to you a very, very unusual word. You know, I, I spoke this message seven years ago and felt like the Lord led me to this text here in Luke 11. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke 11. And as I, as I begin to read and study and do a deep dive into this moment in this passage where here's Jesus and, and Jesus heals this man and all of a sudden the religious rulers are having these issues with Jesus and they're condemning him and, and saying that you're healing through the power of Satan. And Jesus says something so profound. He says a kingdom divided can't stand. A house divided can't stand. And it made me realize something that I think too, too often, too often there are, there are things in our life that are causing contention, things in our life that are counteracting really what God wants to do. And, and sometimes, can I be honest with you, sometimes the reason I don't see the breakthrough that I want and the miracle that I'm believing God for, you know what, I have a, I'm double-minded. I've got two parts of my life contending against one another and I'm trying to see victories and I'm trying to see breakthrough but I can't get there and I, I truly believe that this morning God wants to establish his authority his power and his victory in your life how many of you guys could use some of that victory this morning come on how many of you guys are believing God for breakthrough in your life so I want us I want us to look at Luke chapter 11 and, and let's read together starting with verse 14 as we get into the word Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can this kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. Now listen to this, you ready? But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. 
Lord, I thank you for your presence that is in this place. Lord, you are here, and you are moving, and you are working. Lord, you are speaking to us, and I pray open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, that we may be changed by the power of your word. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen and amen. As we look at this passage here in the book of Luke, as we take a deep dive in this, we see so many facets of what Jesus is saying and trying to help us understand of the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God functions, but also how the kingdom of Satan, the kingdoms of this world, the kingdom of darkness functions. And he makes a very, very clear delineation between how God functions and how the world and how the demonic functions. And what's very clear to me is in this passage, Jesus is speaking to us, helping us understand that we are in a spiritual war. That there's a war for your soul, there's a war for your destiny, that we are in a spiritual battle and that we've got to contend and that we've got to fight and it's not going to be easy. There may be times where you feel like you're going to lose it, but you got to war against the enemy and that God has made you more than conquerors. You are victorious in the name of Jesus. So as we look at this passage, I'm calling this message this morning, Swatting flies. Look at that person next to you and say, swatting flies. Let me tell you a story before we really extrapolate from this passage. Let me tell you a story. And it was years ago, my wife, we, we were here on Oahu and we were, I was cooking. Anybody here, any, any cooks in the house? Come on, you like to cook. How, you know how you can recognize a cook? How many dishes they use. Like, like, the, the, more, the, the higher level in cooking they are, the more dishes for some reason they have to use. And so my wife loves when I cook, but the dishes are just crazy. Like they pile high. And so I was making dinner, man. I, was, I think I used every dish in the cabinet. You know what I'm talking about? Every pan you could possibly use, I used. And uh, the, the, the dishes were stacking high in the sink, and the trash, of course, is, 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 is totally loaded. And, and, uh, and so then it was, the problem was we had a meeting, and it was time to go. And so we finished eating, and I said, listen, just leave the dishes in the sink, leave the trash, I'll take care of it when we get back. Right? Like a good husband. I'll take care of it when we get back. Or I'll take care of it when my show is over. I know none of you do that kind of thing. But I'll take care of it when we come back from the meeting. And so we go to our meeting. We're there at a meeting for a few hours. And we come back to a cloud of flies. A swarm of flies had infiltrated our home. And I'm telling you, you walked in there. You could, if you opened your mouth, you'd be swallowing a fly. I'm, I'm not joking. There were so many flies, and I'm like, what is going on here? And we're freaking out. My wife's screaming. My kids are crying because they're still really young. They're freaking out. I'm running around the house, and I grab the fly swatter, and I'm, fl I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I, you're, you're just swinging like this, hitting stuff. Boom, 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 boom. I can feel them. So many flies. I'm telling you, it was like a cloud of flies. And we are freaking out. And I'm, I'm running around the house with the authority I'm, I'm swatting flies like crazy. But can I tell you, I got to the point where I realized something. This is useless. I've got to deal with the issue. Well, what I didn't know is that my kids, before we left, our kids were out on the balcony and they were playing. And when we left, we left in such a hurry that one of the kids forgot to shut the screen door. So for the three hours that we were gone, three hours plus that we were gone with a loaded sink of dirty dishes and a loaded trash can, those flies came in and had their way with our house. And we arrived to a house full of flies. And now here I am, and I'm trying to swat at these flies and kill all these flies. But I realized that I wasn't going to deal with the problem until I went to the source. And the problem was we had open doors and we had a trash can full of trash. So you know what I had to do? I had to shut the door. I had to close the door and I had to take out the trash. I had to clean the environment. Before I tried to swat the flies, I had to deal with the main source. I had to shut the door and I had to take out the trash. I had to what? 
shut the door and had to take out the trash. Well, what we see very clearly here in this passage in Luke 11 is Jesus is telling us, how do we deal with the flies in our life? How do we deal with the demonic? How do we take authority over these things? Now, it's interesting because here they actually call Satan Beelzebub. They use the phrase, the word Beelzebub, and they say that he cast out Satan or he cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Now, that word Beelzebub, actually, it's another word for Satan. But the word (laughs) comes from the idea of the Lord of Dung. Uh, that's, uh, that's actually, that's what the word Beelzebub means, is the Lord of dung or the Lord of the flies. The Lord of the flies. The Lord of dung. And that's what they were accusing Jesus of being. But here we see very plainly that that is the devil. That is how Satan works. The devil is like a fly. He is the Lord of the flies. And it it really refers to the devil's destructive nature. In John 10.10, many of you know this passage, John 10.10, the Bible says so clearly, and if you know it, just say it with me, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. This isn't a suggestion like, you know, sometimes the devil, he's mean like that. No, it reveals the nature of the devil. The devil comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He doesn't have any other motive than to kill you and to destroy. He wants to kill your marriage. He wants to destroy your business. He wants to destroy every part of your life. That is his aim. He's not in it to play games. He actually doesn't even want to mess you up. He wants to destroy you. He wants to spoil everything in your life. You know, I I began to do research on the fly, probably one of the worst things I ever did in my life. You know what I found about the fly? The fly's body is actually too big for its wings. And so a fly, the way they fly around, they have to exert a lot of energy. That's why you don't ever see a fly fly a long, long distance. They're constantly fly, land, fly, land, fly, land, fly, land, because their wingspan and the size of their body. But what's interesting is because of their weight in comparison to their wingspan, their body mass in comparison to their wingspan, every time they land, it jars them. Every time a fly, a fly doesn't come in, you know, every time a, a fly lands, it's boom, it lands. And it actually is said that every time a fly lands, it vomits a little bit. Think about what landed on your food last night. You know, I, hey, when I was a kid, bro, when fly would land on my sandwich, ah, bro, I ham them. You know what I mean? I pound them, like not in. After reading that, a fly, bro, done already. I'm not, no, I'm not eating that. Ah, just cut it off. No, you don't understand. I don't know where that vomit went. Blah! all over my food, my sandwich, gone. It's ruined. It's ruined for me already. It's ruined. See, every time a fly lands on something, it spoils it. It ruins it. It's its nature. Friends, listen to me. It's the devil's nature to kill, steal, and destroy. Can you imagine to be in open waters with a great white shark? Ah, oh, we're just going to go hang out with the great white shark. Just want to get to study more. You know, I've watched all those documentaries. Every documentary I've ever watched about great white sharks, guess what? The person's in a tank with bars all around it observing the shark. Hello? Why? Because they know what a great white does. They ain't going to mess around. But why in the world do we insist on trying to swim in open waters with the devil? When we know it's his nature. Oh, we'll just flirt with him a little bit. We'll just hang out. Oh, you know, Pastor, I'm just going to invite him in for, for a dinner. Just, it's just a dinner. When his very nature is to kill, steal, and to destroy. But you see, I got good news for you. Look at that person next to you and say, he's got some good news. I got some good news for you. You have authority. You have power. I'll say it again. You have what? You have been given authority by Christ. Jesus tells his disciples, says very clearly, all authority has been given unto me. 
Jesus has authority. And this is what he tells Peter. Listen to this. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, this is his word to us as his disciples, as Jesus followers. Listen to this. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And so whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be, come on, every, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So, Curtis, come on up here real quick. I want, I want to kind of give you an understanding of what this means. You see, we have to recognize that the authority that we have to function in the power of God is not in and of ourselves. You know, you can be intimidating. You can try and be intimidating. You can hold your shoulders back and be like, what, devil? you like, scrap right now. Why? Right? Walk around, try and intimidate the devil. But it doesn't work by that. It doesn't work that way. The devil's not intimidated by your stature. He's not intimidated by your noise. The louder you get, the, the, the devil runs. No, that's not how it works. The only thing that intimidates the devil is the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And so here very clearly Jesus tells us that the, the issue of binding and loosing comes by his authority. So now this is what it means. That whatever I bind here on earth, whatever I bind here on earth is bound in the place where he is. So that means that here my authority is predicated, is built upon, is reliant upon his authority. It's not my authority. It's whose authority? It's him in heaven. The Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He's in a place of authority and power. So when I pray to him, when I call upon Jesus, when I declare his name, I function in his authority. However, there's a problem with the authority of Christ. And this is what it is. The only way that I get to function in the fullness of his authority is if he's my authority. I want you to think about that for a moment. See, the sons of Sceva, these guys who wanted to cast out demons, they had this, they had this campaign, let's go, let's go demon hunting. Right? They wanted to go hunt demons. And so they would go find demons, and they say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, what was the problem? The problem wasn't the lack of declaring Jesus' name. The problem was Jesus wasn't their authority, so they had no access to Jesus' authority. What gives you access to his authority is when you make him your authority. You got to get this in your spirit. Because a lot of people out there, they're like, they want to cast out demons. They want to lay hands on the sick. They want to function in Jesus' authority, but they have no access to his authority. Why? Because Jesus is not their authority. Have you given Jesus authority over your life? That's how authority works. We want, we want authority to kind of operate like the police, don't we? When I have a problem, oh, I'm going to call the authorities. How Jesus works is this. I protect everything that belongs to me. So those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But we have to make him our authority. And once he becomes our authority, we now get to access his authority to cast out demons, to lay hands on the sick, to walk in the power of of Jesus. Come on, give it up to this mighty man of God. But see, so you say, well, pastor, what is, the, what is the issue of binding and loosing me? Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosened. Very simply, I want you to see this. It's two words, restrict and release. Everybody say restrict and release. See, the issue of restricting is this, that by the authority of Jesus, we now can actually restrict the enemy from moving. I'm sorry, devil, you don't have no right here. I'm sorry, devil, you can't move here. I'm sorry, devil, you can't do what you want to do here. Why? I restrict you. I bind you up. I hinder you. The devil now becomes hindered from operating in his authority. Why? Because the authority of Christ is greater than the authority of the enemy. And so as we're operating in the authority of Jesus, and we now have the name that is above every name, 
that we can actually restrict the devil from moving in our life. We can restrict the devil from having access to our life, access to our marriage. Come on, somebody. I'm sorry, devil, you can't function in my marriage today. Why? Because my marriage is under the authority of Jesus. Everybody with me? But at the same time, there's supernatural release. You know, there's this moment Many of you know the story of the woman. There's a woman who had an issue of blood. She was bleeding constantly. She has this idea, if I could just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, I'll be healed. So she touches the hem of Jesus' garment, and Jesus' response is so profound. Jesus stops. He says, whoa, somebody touched me. His disciples are like, Jesus, there's people all around you touching you. He says, no, 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 you don't understand. Somebody touched me differently. Because he said, I felt healing virtue leave me. Everybody say release. I felt healing virtue leave my body. Jesus was a reservoir of healing in power and authority. You, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are a reservoir of authority and healing and power. Did you hear what I just said? Because of the Holy Spirit, you are a reservoir. So if people come and draw from that reservoir, there's a release. Why do you think we lay hands on people? Is it just some spiritual thing? That we, no, it's called a release. I was talking to Nathan about this just the other day. A lot of times people will lay hands on people and not understand the power of that releasing of the healing virtue of the Lord. If my life is filled, whatever fills you will come out of you. Come on, somebody. Whatever fills you will come out of you. So as you're laying hands on somebody, if I'm filled with faith and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm filled with power, when I lay hands on somebody, what's going to transfer to that person? So we have to think that release. The power of binding and loosing, restricting the enemy from moving. Come on, somebody. Restricting the enemy from having his way, but releasing the power and the authority of Jesus. That's what you carry. Come on, look at that person next to you and say, that's what you carry. Come on, let's say that that's what you carry. Look at that other person and say, that's what you carry. You have authority. But the thing we have to understand, and this is where things get rough. Can, I, can you just bear with me here? One of the greatest issues that we have is called the law of rights. Go ahead and write that down. The what? The law of rights. How the enemy works is the enemy works by rights. What he has rights to, the enemy can only move and manipulate and control that which he has rights to. So if he has rights to your mind, if he has rights to your life and rights to your marriage, you say, well, pastor, how does that work? Well, let me tell you, you ready? Here's the law of rights. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 15. Romans chapter 6, verse 15. Paul says this, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? So this is what Paul is dealing with. He's saying, look, we're saved by grace. We're not saved by our own works, lest any of us should boast. We are saved by the grace of Jesus. Can I get an amen on that? We're saved by the grace of Jesus. But Paul says, look, if you're not careful, you'll step into the grace of God, but you'll live however you want to live, and you will have a misunderstanding in your life of the law of rights that gives the enemy access to you. And so watch what he says. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you love the Lord. You've given your life to the Lord. You've said a salvation prayer, and it is only by the grace of God. But then he says this, by no means, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, this is the ticket right here. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you came to obey. Somebody say obey. You came to obey from your heart the pattern of the teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So the issue of rights has everything to do 
with obedience. That what you choose to obey, you become a slave to. So if you choose to obey your flesh, you become a slave to your flesh. If you choose to obey the devil and obey that anger and obey that rage, you yield to it and you get, I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna be angry. And you yield to it, guess what happens? It gives the enemy rights. Why? Because he operates from the position of obedience. If you obey him in certain areas of your life, if you open the door to certain areas of your life, you give him rights. Well, pastor, I love Jesus. I'm not talking about your love for Jesus. Stop. I'm not even talking about your salvation. I'm talking about your cracks. I'm talking about the cracks in your life. I want you to just imagine for a moment that you get a knock at the door. So you go to the door and you have a little peephole and you look through that peephole and outside that door is a guy holding a bat, a guy holding a gun, and another guy holding a bag ready to come in your house and kill, steal, and destroy you. That's what, that's what their intent is. And you know as you're looking through that peephole, you're like, oh no! And you know the only thing that stands between you and them coming and having their way in your home is that door that's locked. And you look at outside that door, knowing the threat's there. And what you do is you unlock the door. You unlock all the deadbolts. And you open the door and say, man, I really hope they don't come in. Now, I'm not inviting them in. I'm not, I'm not inviting them in, but I'm opening the door. So that takes me to our first point. Number one, if we're going to deal with the flies in our life, we're going to deal with the enemy in our life. Number one, we've got to close the door. Come on, everybody say, close the door. Look at this passage in, in Luke 11. Look what he says. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. That means you need to guard your house. You need to guard the doors of your life. That means you can't just open the door to something. And I, friends, we got to be careful. I, just the other day, can I be honest with you? Just the other day, my wife rebuked me because I was watching a movie. And all of a sudden, the people on the movie had the audacity to cuss in my home. And my kids were right there. Now, see, I'm used to cussing. I'm a pastor. I work at a church. For real though. Um, but my, my girls, my innocent girls were there. And now they're being inundated with all this garbage. And my wife looked at me and like, really? You gonna allow that in our house? And I'm thinking selfishly, oh, it doesn't impact me, babe. I'm a grown up. But I'm letting it into my house. I'm cracking open the door. You may not realize it, but that thing you're watching you're cracking open the door. That thing that you're doing, those things that you're saying, the things that you're allowing into your life, you're cracking open the door, and that crack gives the enemy rights. Friends, I'm not talking about a salvation issue right now. Now, I truly believe this, that what Hebrews 3.13 says, that we need to encourage one another daily so that our hearts are not hardened by sin's deceitfulness. The bigger the crack gets, the more rights you give the enemy. You know what he begins to do? His main goal is to harden your heart. Where you begin to lose that sensitivity to the Lord. You begin to lose that sensitivity. You become so desensitized. Get, have you ever wondered this? Can I just deal with this for a second? Think about this for a moment. Have you ever watched those commercials? With those, those children, those starving children, and it breaks your heart, doesn't it? Those starving children. I'm watching this commercial, and I see these children, and child after child after child, they're starving, they look the same, but I notice something else. There's flies swarming all around them. Picture after picture, it's almost like, just to show you the despair, they wanna make sure that each child they take a picture of, there's flies all over them. And the, the hard thing for me is I'm the type of person, if a, if a fly lands on my leg, I'm like shaking my leg. And I'm watching this commercial, 
And here's this child with flies all over. And you know what's the crazy thing? They don't do anything. And so I, I ask myself this question, why, why, why aren't they swatting away the fly? You know why it is? Number one, they become accustomed to it. They become so desensitized that they become so accustomed to the flies that it's just a part of life. But secondly, they become so physically weak and emaciated, they no longer have the strength to, fly, to, 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 to chew the flies away. So now they just accept it. See, what the devil wants to do is he wants to get you so desensitized and so accustomed to what he does, and he wants to leave you so spiritually emaciated that you, number one, get used to it, and number two, don't have the strength to fight against it anymore. Are you with me? That's how the devil works. So we have flies. Our life is inundated with these flies and all these issues and these problems and, and, and sin and, and, and things. The enemy has crept in, and we become so used to it. It's just a part of life, Pastor. But we have to become guards. You got to shut the door. Come on, somebody, shut the door. I, I, I kind of freaked out at my kids the other day because there's a, I hate flies. After that experience, let me tell you something. My relationship with flies has never been the same. Especially after reading about flies. Never been the same. And there was a fly in the house the other day. And I'm freaking out. What was the first thing I, I Before I even grabbed the fly swatter, you know the first thing I did? Someone left the door open. Shut that door. Why? Because if we leave the door open, guess what? More flies are coming in. I believe the first thing we got to do, if we're going to deal with those flies, we're going to deal with the sin in our life, we're going to deal with those areas of contention, our relationship with the Lord, we got to shut the door. Come on, someone say shut the door. But the second thing we have to do is we got to take out the trash. You got to take out the trash. James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do you know what James is teaching us right now? He's teaching us how to deal with the trash, how to deal with the sin, how to deal with the addiction in our life. I'll say it again. He's training us. He's teaching us how to deal with the sin and the addiction and the brokenness of our life. He says, you want to be free, then you've got to do these two things. It's simple. Everything that he said could be, could, could be summarized in these two words. Number one, intimacy with God. You've got to draw near to him. Now, you see, it's opposite. A lot of times we think in our mind, the only way I can draw near to God is I have to be perfect, I have to be washed, I have to be clean. And so what happens is the, 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 the enemy brings condemnation, shame, and guilt and use it as, uses it against us to say, no, don't go to God. God doesn't love you. God doesn't like you. He's angry at you. But what James is telling us, the very thing that we need to do when we're caught in sin or when we're battling with that addiction is we need to go to Jesus. Come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, I will take it upon me. He says, come to me. Because he understands this, that the power and the victory we have over sin comes from intimacy with God. We get it wrong. We think that once we get free from sin, then we can have intimacy. But the truth of the reality of how we function is we come to walk in intimacy in a relationship with, we come to him first. We come to him first. And then he strengthens us and empowers us to have victory over the enemy. So it's a call to intimacy. Humble yourself. Come to God. Say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I want you. I desire you, Lord. Don't allow what, what, what Paul deals with in Romans 8. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't allow condemnation, shame, and guilt to, help, to hinder you anymore. You know, I'm just going to say this. You know, next month, month of February, we have a brand new series. 
We're taking a, we, we did a, a couple's retreat and called it The Naked Truth. And we felt like, hey, we're going to make a series out of this. In the month of February, we're doing a series called The Naked Truth. And you know what we're dealing with? We're going to confront condemnation. We're going to confront shame. We're going to, oh, come on, somebody. We're going to restore dignity again in the lives of people. I, I truly, truly believe it. We're going to restore dignity. We've got to come to Jesus. Don't let the devil lie to you. The word of God makes it very clear that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive you your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So the second part of this, this passage here in James, number one is intimacy, a call to intimacy. Come to God, come to God. Come on, someone say, come to God. But secondly, you got to repent. you got to repent. Now, can I tell you a part of repentance that a lot of us don't want to talk about? See, I have an issue. I don't know about you, but I love, can I just tell you right now, I love the fake cheese at the drive through place. There's something special about it. You know what I'm saying? Like that fake cheese, you didn't know it was fake. It's fake. It's, I don't know what it is. They put stuff in there. And for some reason, when I drive by that fast food place, I smell it. It's intoxicating because my body knows it and loves it and craves it but it's killing me. Anybody, hello? So until I get the revelation of the death that that fast food restaurant causes me, I'll keep going around the drive-through. <laughs> Bring it on, baby. Come on. Let's go. I want some more. I want some more. I want some more. Hello? But once I get the revelation of how it's killing me, until I get that revelation, I'll never deal with it properly. See, that's how sin works. Until you get the revelation of how sin is killing you, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So until you get the revelation, see, a lot of people think, well, the wages of sin is just badness. Friends, sin has nothing to do with good or bad. Sin doesn't make you bad just as Jesus doesn't make you good. Okay, hold on a second. Because we, we actually think salvation... And sin is an issue of goodness and badness. It has nothing to do with goodness and badness. The wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life. Salvation and sin is an issue of life and death, not good or bad. See, a lot of people, if you go, oh, well, it's just badness. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a bad boy for a day. You're inviting death into your life. It's not about bad. It's about death. And Christ is not about just good. I want to have a good day today. It's about life and life more abundantly. Are you getting this? All right, hello, come on, somebody. So what we have to recognize here is we, in order to truly walk in repentance, yes, there is a turning. There is a turning that has to happen to Jesus. It's not necessarily what you're turning from because, look, Paul says it very clearly. You can turn from sin, but unless you're turning to Christ, there is no salvation. That's why he deals with the law, because a lot of people were dealing from sin, but they were turning to the law. And he says, look, friends, the law can't save you. The only possible way you can be saved is, look, I'm glad you're giving up your bad habit. I'm glad you're giving up that sin. But unless you turn to Christ, there is no salvation available for you. It's turning to Jesus. But friends, until we can actually have a revelation of what happens and what sin is doing to our life, we'll still flirt with it. Pastor, what I'm watching is really not that bad. What I'm saying is really, it's really not that bad. Oh, pastor, stop being so sheltered. Oh, you, you must be one of those homeschool kids that grew up in church, huh? Listen, I'd much rather be sheltered and naive than be defiled. Because we've got to change our attitude concerning sin. Call sin, sin. And deal with it the way Christ dealt with it. You know how Christ dealt with sin? He made a public spectacle of it, nailing it to the cross. Hello! So we should do the same. We need to repent. And that's, that's really it. Look, th this is what's so amazing. Is how do we, Pastor, how do I deal with the trash in my life? 
Develop an intimate relationship with Jesus. Go to Jesus first. Before anything, just run to him. Cry out to him. Those who call, those who call, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And turn your back on sin. Repent, repent, cry out to him, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I acknowledge that that thing that I did, that thing that I said, that area of my life, I acknowledge that that is from the devil, it's straight from the pit of hell, and it's producing death in my life, and I want nothing more to do with it. I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to Subway. Eat fresh. Everybody say, shut the door. Everybody say, take out the trash. But can I give you this last one? Minister Milo, if you'll come. Wow, I've got to close. You guys have been enjoying this this morning? Cover your wounds. So remember I was telling you I did that deep dive into understanding the life of a fly. You know the reason why flies are drawn to open wounds? is because an open wound creates the perfect environment for them to plant a seed. Now, you don't know it, but when that fly actually lands on your open wound, it's planting a seed. Because that open wound is the perfect environment for their larva to grow. Do you know why the devil loves open wounds? It's because it's the perfect environment for him to plant a seed. So if he, can, if he can get you offended, whoo, yeah, plant that seed. He can get you angry. If he can get you hurt some way, he, can, that he's, he's gonna, he may not have even caused the wound. Somebody, issues in life might have caused the wound, but I'm telling you this much, he's drawn to that wound because he knows, oh man, if I can get in there before they cover this thing up, I can plant a seed that will destroy them and cause an infection. Listen to this. Psalms 147.3, it says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That word binds actually means to cover. To cover and bring together to heal. Can I share with you one last story and then I'm done? Is that okay? Can I share one last story and then I'll, I'll finish today? So when I was a kid, I, I love skateboarding. I wasn't any good at it. It's kind of like golf. I love golf, but I'm horrible at it. And I love skateboarding. And so for Christmas, my parents bought me one of those scab skateboards. You guys remember, anybody remember those scab skateboards? They're like plastic, hard plastic. And they would actually bend in the middle, real narrow boards. And, and they, had these, they had these wheels that were really wide really wide wheels and, and there's like no indentation on them at all. It's like, it, it, was, it was really weird, but it was just flat and wide. And I was so happy I got this board. And, and there's some kids, some older kids in the neighborhood that would go down this road and we had this really nice steep road and they'd go down this road and carve up the, the road like it was a wave. And like one of these days. So today was my day. And I got my board and I got up at the top of that hill. I was like, I'm going to ride this baby. So I got there and I was going slow. And as I, as I continued to go side to side, I started picking up speed. Pastor Andrew, I was going fast, man. I was, it was, that too was gnarly, man. And I was going and I was going all of a sudden, I hit a pebble. Anybody here ever hit a pebble? Come on, anybody here ever? Maybe some of you hit a pebble on your way to church today. But because of the way my wheels were designed, that little pebble stopped my board dead in its tracks. And I hit that pebble and I went flying. But it wasn't like a, a cool fly. You know what I mean? I didn't like fly and then tuck and roll and be like, yeah. It was an ugly fly. Like I thought I was already on the ground and I started running. But the problem was I was still in the air. You ever seen somebody run in the air like that? They think they're on the, and then I, then I, yeah, by the time I hit the ground, I was on my knees. I was all over the place, man. I was all over, and I ran, I ran to my house screaming, Mom, I'm going to die. And my mom grabs me, and I'm thinking, you know, she's going to hold me in her arms and comfort me and coddle me. But she grabs me by the arm, and she throws me in the shower. 
So I'm thinking in my mind, oh, this is going to be awesome. She's going to turn on the nice, soothing, hot water and just wash me. But instead, she comes with a bottle of hydrogen peroxide and just starts dousing me with hydrogen peroxide. And as my skin is boiling, you know what I'm talking about? The bubbles from the hydrogen peroxide is all over the place. And I'm bubbling from the hydrogen peroxide. I'm screaming because the pain is just excruciating. And I'm screaming, I'm like, Mom, why? Why would you do this to me? And I learned a very, very valuable lesson that day. But you got to clean out those wounds. You got to clean out those wounds. You got to deal with the infection. How you dress your wounds will determine how it heals. I'll say it again. How you dress your wounds will determine how it heals. You got to keep it clean. Come on, you, you can't allow infection. You can't allow that thing to constantly get exposed. You got to cover it. You got to keep it covered. You know what I like about it too? You got to put ointment on it. I actually researched how do you clean a wound? How do you, how do you keep a wound from scarring? That's what they said. Number one, you got to clean it thoroughly. Number two, you got to put ointment on it. We need the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. We need the Holy Ghost. And number three, you got to keep it covered so it's not susceptible to infection. Friends, we do the same thing. He needs to cover us. Too often, you know, can I just be honest with you? Too often in my life, I rip that Band-Aid off. I don't know if it's because I want everybody to see my wounds so they feel bad for me. Or maybe I want them to see my wounds so it justifies why I do what I do. But sometimes I become the enemy of my infection. I really propagate my own infection because I continue to pull off that covering because instead of giving it to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I'm going to allow you to take care of this. Jesus, I need you to heal me. Jesus, I need you to do the work. I, I give it to you, Lord. I keep ripping it off and making it an issue in my life and keep exposing it. But Jesus wants to heal us. And friends, if we're, if we're going to have victory, and I've got to close right now, but if we're going to have victory over the enemy, we've got to shut the doors. We've got to take out the trash, and we've got to cover the wounds. We've got to shut the doors. You've got to take out the trash, and you've got to cover your wounds. And if you're here and you say, Pastor, i got some open doors in my life, Maybe you're here, you say, Pastor, I've got some trash in my life. I'll be real. I've got some addictions, some things that I'm holding on to, some of the stuff's under the carpet, Pastor. Maybe you're here and you can be honest. You say, Pastor, I've got some open wounds. Will you pray for me? Friends, I'm not here to condemn you, but I truly believe Jesus is here to heal you right now. And Jesus is here to do a work that only he can do. So I'm going to ask everyone, if you just stand to your feet, come on, let's just worship the Lord. I want us... I want us to lift our voice to him. And let's just thank him for all that. Take me deeper. Deeper than before. Lord, I'm ready. Oh, I'm ready.
God, this morning, can we, can we all just say this prayer together? Because I, maybe I'm the only one here that, that, um, that has the potential to wrestle with, with all three of these areas of my life that I'm, I'm constantly on guard to say, wow, I've, I've got some cracks in my life. I've got to make sure I remove some of the stuff in my life. I've got to make sure that I'm constantly staying covered by the love and by the grace, by the Holy Spirit. And so if you're here this morning, say, Pastor, this message, there's, there's an aspect of this message that applies to me. I'm just going to ask you just to lift your hands to the Lord. If you can say that, because really the reason I'm having you lift your hands to the Lord is not, it's not, it's not any spiritual thing. It's not you're more anointed by lifting your hands. It's, it's, it's an act of surrender to say, Pastor, I acknowledge, I admit that I need God to help me in this area. And will you say this prayer with me? Jesus, I need you. Help me. Heal me. Jesus, by your grace and your power, Will you remove all the trash from my life? Every bit of sin, every addiction. Jesus, bring healing to my heart. And Lord, I pray, give me the strength to shut the door on the enemy, to walk in your authority. Jesus, I believe in you and all that you've done for me. And I receive your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give Jesus some praise this morning? Come on, let's give Jesus some praise this morning. I wanna encourage you in something this week, this week. Many of you, many of you, I'm telling you, because we're creating patterns in our life, we'll walk around, we'll just be swatting at flies. I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. Ah! Look, operate in the God-given authority that you have. Swat some flies, come on. But at the same time, this week, we're going to close some doors. We're going to take out the trash. And we're going to cover those wounds. And we're not going to give the enemy place in our life. I'll say that again. We're going to refuse to give the enemy place in our life this week. Amen. Will you lift your hands to the Lord? Let me pray a final blessing over you. Father, I thank you for the people of this house, this incredible congregation. Lord, people full of faith and power. And Lord, I declare over their life that this week will be a week of blessing. This week will be a week of divine appointments. Lord, this week will be a week of power and authority. Lord, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. That they will be more than conquerors. That they will walk in the fullness of what you have for them. Lord, that they will not back down, but they will have confidence, Lord, to come to you. That no matter what they face... No matter what hell brings their way, they know that there's a heaven, that there's a God that is greater than anything. And so, Lord, I declare it over their lives now. Boldness, strength, confidence in Jesus' name. Divine appointments, and let's say it together, crazy, crazy favor in Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. Have an awesome day.